Right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, to another SEC event. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to Ross, who will be the, the compare today. Uh, but I just wanted to welcome everybody very briefly. Um, as most of you hopefully will know, my name is Pim van and I'm CEO of the Sales and Technology Cluster. Um, very sort of important um, and evocative subject today. Uh, it's very much going to be a, a, um, sort of a work format. So we will have a, a breakout room where we all put you back into the social lounge. Uh, and please look up um, your, your table number that we assigned you so you can participate in the, in the discussions. Uh, the point is that you get a lot out today, so please do do participate. But I'm sure Ross will, uh, will mention this and guide you through. So enough from me. Ross, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pim. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next second um, meeting uh, of the Silverstone Technology Cluster Gender Equality and Diversity Committee. This is a follow on event from our first workshop in October. And in that first workshop, we were exploring the issues and consider, considering what could be done. Um, we looked at you know, why businesses should be interested in gender equality. And people did bravely sort of share their stories to try and bring the issue into the light, really, and to challenge um, what, what their experiences have been and to think, how do we prevent this from happening in the future. And we heard from Hannah Ingram Moore from, from Matrix and Julia Muir from the Automotive 30% Club, who are both uh, committee members for, for the Gender Equality and Diversity Committee for STC. Uh, Helen um, Wild chaired the session, and we were really talking about the key ways to consider the topic of gender equality at work. Um, so um, you, you hopefully you know I'm I'm Ros Bird, I'm the uh, Commercial Director for Silverstone Park. I'm Chair of Silverstone Technology Cluster. And uh, it's a great privilege and opportunity to have the chance to bring like-minded people together as we are doing um, today to look at this subject that's so important for the future of our businesses, for young people and people that are gonna retrain and um, want to come into our industry. You know, point we made at the last session is why wouldn't we want all young people and all those people returning or retraining to want to come and work in our industry, Silverstone Technology Cluster. Wouldn't it be great if we could attract all male and female students, um, you know, the, the, uh, with the right attitude, ones that want to come and contribute. And um, to do that, we need to think about our businesses are fit for purpose. Um, are we doing all we can to attract these people? And um, once we've got them joining our organisation, um, how do we treat them? How does everyone behave to make sure that people stay bright eyed and bushy tailed and motivated and want to work hard and get excited about your business like you are? So I think today we're going to move on. We're going to use this session as a chance to go from, OK, you attended the previous session or maybe this is your first time. Um, you, you sort of understand that this issue needs some work and you need to put some focus on it. So we're going to assume that you've moved from needing to be convinced that this is a good problem to solve to wanting to know how, what you can personally do to, to make some changes and um, increase, um, you know, the, the, the talent pool, basically, for your, for your business. So before we move on, um, I just wanted to do a quick reminder of some of the kind of guiding principles as we them within our committee. Um, the ones that I think others have said has been helpful to go through because it takes the subject out of the too difficult box and they were the things that we covered in a bit more detail in the last session and that session's available on YouTube if you want to. It's a couple of hours obviously you don't have to watch the whole lot at one go but um, we cover some of these things and the starting you know foundations of why this subject's important and what's been happening that's in that youtube video and pim will send you the link to that so guiding principles to take the subject out of the too difficult box are things like trying to make sure your environment is inclusive by removing barriers to women joining and if you can do that you're going to help to solve this skills issue that you're all concerned about because if you think about it 51 percent of the uh, population is women so you should probably if you've got no barriers to women joining, have about 50% at all levels in your organisation. So all those bright young things in the assembly rooms that we stand and talk, um, that the 
that aren't joining um, or, or even considering a career with you, they're the ones that we're thinking, how do we attract them? Clearly, if they're in your organisation already, there are some barriers preventing them to join. So another thing to say is that we, we remember that, you know, as a business, you're going to need to stay current with society or you risk becoming obsolete. And obsolescence means that you miss the pro new problems of the day, um, that you have a um, workforce that uh, is, is uh, perhaps lopsided in its views of the world, um, so that they won't be a problem solve um, issues in society as well as if you had a diverse team. You're probably creating uh, environments in your workplace that can turn off customers and certainly turn off new recruits. So. We need to, to stay up with this subject matter, up with society, evolve our thinking in our business in order to attract people, identify problems that need solving and, you know, serve our customers, whether they're B2B or, or B2C. Another thing to say, gender equality uh, is not a women's issue. It's society's issue to solve. And, you know, sexist behaviour does come from men and women and the behaviour that promotes equality comes from both men and women so this is a problem for all of us to solve together there's no us and them in it um, and then another point is that casual sexism uh, there's no place for it. Um, it it perpetuates the problem all that stuff about pink jobs and blue jobs or men can't multitask it, it's just creating the wrong kind of culture in your organization and uh, it, it, yeah we need to look at ways to remove that um, from people um, in, the, in their everyday discussions and the way that they work with each other in the culture of the business. And then um, just a couple more things. One is childcare is not a women's issue. Um, you know, the flexibility to work close to your children um, where they are at nursery, to take the kids to school or whatever it might be, and to care for others um, is something that is a right for, for men and women. And, and we need to think about that as, as a business community. So overall, we're saying that this is a really good problem to solve and you guys are all problem solvers. So let's look at how we can start making changes in our businesses start today. And, and the way that we've set today up to help with that is that in a moment you're going to hear conversation live between um, Helen Wilde, who's the um, MD of East Coast Trains, with Julia Muir, founder of the Automotive 30 Club. Um, you will then um, have an interview that we've pre-recorded uh, that Julie has done last week, especially for today's session, an interview with a guy called John Tordoff, who's the CEO of JCT 600. And then once you've had that insight and that sort of feeding, really, of information, and hopefully it's thought provoking, we're then going to go into these breakout sessions, which PIM has organised, small groups, 25 minutes to consider, you know, what each business might do next. What do you? What could you do next? There'll be a move. Come back in for a summary of, of that discussion, and we'll appoint um, a person within each group that can then feedback, and there'll be some final points, and we'll wrap up at quarter to twelve. Um, and we can make up. I, I think we're running three or four minutes late at the moment. We'll make that time up as we go through. I'll, I'll make sure of it. Okay. So um, without further ado, then um, the first um, session as I say, um, is a conversation um, which is following the publication um, of the book, Change the Game, which um, was launched uh, at the in International Women's Day. Um, it's a book that Julia Muir has written. She's the founder of Automotive 30% Club. And it's all about how to become an inclusive leader. And Helen, who's the MD of East Coast Trains, is going to talk with Julia about this and think about you know the book um the content of that book the event in october what we discussed there and how we can move on now to this next stage of um changing the game you know in our workplaces so helen and julia over to you two thanks ross thank you very much so good morning everybody well, i'm delighted to be uh, participating in the event again today and um what julia and i are going to do is we're going to pick through some of the things that she raises for her that we discussed last time at the last event 
focusing really on, you know, these are difficult issues. So let's not pretend it's quite difficult conversation. Some of these things to have tricky conversations always are. But how we can help you as STC members to feel positive about the task, because the thing is, you know, a more balanced, gender balanced uh, company is always more successful statistically than you're ever going to have if you don't have that balance. Um, and I think where we've got to in our conversations over the events is really about what are the steps we now need to take to move things forward. So what we're going, we're going to tease some of that out from Julia's experience uh, and from her book and, and discuss around some of those issues, things we think which might help. So, um, Julia, the, the first thing I, I just wanted to start with is um, I think it's quite tricky. And you make the point actually very well in your book about knowing where you start. We all start from different places um, in terms of where we are. And you reference particularly understanding the environment and the culture that you're working in. Um, what I found particularly interesting was the concept of understanding if you've got a toxic environment, because, of course, you can't always tell until you start looking at these things, if they are actually toxic or not. And you use two really clever terms, which I think help to unpick how an organisation works and the level of maturity around the behaviours and what shouldn't should be tolerated. And that helps put names against these behaviours. The first one was gaslighting, which I've never heard before, and the second microaggression. Could you start by just elaborating a bit on these elements about culture and the environment, the things to look for in terms of where you're starting from and how does your culture work around them? Will do. Um, I think because I, there's a technical issue with the feedback on my uh, sound, so we are going to have to speak <laughs> it's completely separately, so bear with us for that. So yes, the, the important thing to know is if you're going to try and build an inclusive culture, you have to address issues that might be causing a culture that excludes people uh, or that you know, could actually be toxic to some kind, some types of people. So it's helpful to be able to understand what that looks like and how it manifests itself in certain types of behaviour. So I refer to the term microaggressions, which I think many people have, have encountered that term, but what it actually means is words or actions that are indirect or subtle and sometimes unintentionally discriminatory. And they include things such as um, having the habit of interrupting or talking over women, but not male peers, um, or appropriating women's ideas. It's Sometimes it's kind of some like a joke of the fact that a woman will say something and then a man might just say, oh, I've had an idea. And, and everybody takes it as though that's, that's the man's input and not not the woman's. Um, using language and terminology that might patronise uh, people or implying inferiority by calling adult women girls. Those are all examples of microaggressions. Gaslighting is actually something that happens in all places in the home and at work. And men and women do this to each other, um, but it's a form of psychological manipulation that makes a person sow seeds of doubt in a targeted individual, making them question their own abilities, you, know, you question their own uh, sense of reality. Uh, for example, by saying something um, and then the next day completely denying that that was a reality the day before. And so the person starts to question whether they're going, is there something wrong with, their, with them? Uh, and this, form of gaslighting um, can make people question their abilities, it questions, they question their perception of what's happening and also their judgment. And what we know is that comments aimed at women in the workplace often take this form and so actually do a lot of damage to their career aspirations and self-esteem. And that's at significant cost to the company. Um, and we often think that women act like confidence, but what I hear from women is that they can j often join an organisation fully confident, um, and by the end of their time there, they're feeling as though they, they're not, you know, they're not worthy of anything and probably would never progress. But they've left that organisation and gone to work somewhere else where, that has an inclusive culture, they suddenly realise that the previous what culture was holding them back. Now, I think it's important to just draw the difference between microaggressions and gliding and sexual harassment, because sexual harassment is actually enshrined, the definition is enshrined in law, and is actually a huge um, range of behaviour that, but it, in effect, it's anything that violates the dignity 
or respect of, of an individual or creates an intimidating, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. Um, we know that a recent survey uh, as a result of the, um, the sad death of Sarah Eva found that 100% of women um, revealed that they had been subject to sexual um, harassment or assaults in, in all types of settings. Um, so the important thing is to understand that microaggressions and gaslighting can lead to some harassment. There, it is a, it's kind of a continuum along a scale that, that perpetrators will progress along to. So that's why it's so important to, to um, jump on any kind of um, inappropriate behaviour at the very beginning and so therefore to stop it escalating something bigger. I think that's a really clear point, actually, Julia, that you make, because it effectively it, it's saying you, you're going to set the tone and the culture uh, from the top. I think that takes tremendous bravery um, on, on any leader. Um, and I, I also think the thing that probably it leads to is finding a language which you can utilise to, to make those things clear. Um, as you know, my background's marketing. So one example for me is when we were putting O2 together, um, the marketing director was non-branded activity referred to as not O2, but it came part of the culture. And eventually it was also the culture we were, we were there. And I think as leaders, developing that linguistics and taking it seriously is really, really critical, but also keeping up to date with the thinking like microaggression and gaslighting and the subtle cuts that exist around this very tricky subject so that they can guide and lead that culture with themselves and the senior team. So it's embedded all the way down. I think it's a, it's a really clear point you make there in terms of that cultural piece. Um, so there are some specific actions that we, that we can take. And I think, you know, what we discussed about what we wanted to talk about today was, you know, we've raised awareness of the issue. We're going to explain a little bit more about some of the realities, but then also focus on action. So what can we actually do? Um, and it's, it's useful to look at it as though you can make multiple small gains, you know, um, that can lead to big changes as well as kind of big sweeping uh, changes as well. Um, so the thing to do is to make it very clear to people at the very beginning of your journey on this of what professional behaviour looks like and what's unacceptable. I think at the moment many companies think that that's just kind of in the water. You know, people just should know that. Uh, well, actually, we can't allow room for ambiguity. We have to assume, you know, if, if we're going to make sure people are going to do the right thing, they have to know what the right thing looks like. Having done that, you then need to have a disciplinary policy that makes it very clear what the consequences are of transgressing from that uh, good behaviour. Um, right to the stage of you know, unlawful action, such as um, this sexual harassment or assault, which is breaking the law with regards to the Equalities Act of 2010, should lead to a zero tolerance policy that's gross misconduct and, and dismissal. Small transgressions though that are kind of the starting point that can, could build up to other things need to be stopped straight away by calling them out and we should all have a collective responsibility to do this. It's not for the victim if you like of that behaviour to call it out, it's the whole team. Be saying hang on that's not how we do things here um, and nudge them into doing the right thing because if you don't call it out silence kind of gives tacit approval for that kind of behavior so it's important to equip your staff with that kind of phrases that would gently nudge somebody to realize they've done something wrong there um, without being too aggressive or too offensive to that individual who might have done it in unintentionally and the final action i would say is be very careful about when you're bringing people into your organization um, to actually check references because people who are fired for inappropriate behavior will rarely give an employee reference or, or be truthful about the reason for leaving. And, you know, I'm, so, I'm very aware that, that people that do this will continue to do it as they move around. And you really should be very careful to make sure with your screening processes to not let those people into your organisation to start with. I think that last point is a really interesting one, Julie, because there's also a, a dichotomy there as well. So I, I know I've left jobs in the past, won't tell you which ones, because I haven't liked the culture. And me, um, 
the culture is everything you know it's difficult enough making your way in the world without dealing with latent sexism and everything else which goes with it and you realize that you're on 10 15 less than the blokes because you're a female and at that point i normally bail okay on principle and over the years i found that very difficult to swear on my cv i'm now rewriting my cv and saying i left that one because <laughs> they were paying me 15 percent next than the bloke sitting next to me was actually rubbish at the job anyway um, and it's that latent sexism where i think there's a there's a thing here also about for, for people to say if you because the culture's wrong i would put a big tick in that box as an md if someone says i left because i didn't like the way people were treated i think that would be a tick on the interview sh sh uh, sheet and i think encouraging people to be open um it, you know in terms of those references the other way around as well because it also is a really positive message it is is part of the bravery of making the change uh going forward which sort of nicely brings me on to the whole sarah everard situation which i think most of us have been absolutely horrified in terms of not only what happened to Sarah, but the way the press reported it, I think on occasions was absolutely appalling. Um, and it's sort of an unfurling in terms of, of what people actually say about women in the public light. Um, I think it's brought it into sharp sort of focus for us in terms of gender inequality um, and also calling the immediate account that the subsequent there was an attack on another one, which subsequently was badly reported. Um, I think one of the things we probably need to sort of have a look at is, in, you know, we're still in a position today. What do we need to do ourselves as people in a business? So, you know, we talked about leadership and setting the tone, but people and culture is about everybody. Uh, what are the things that we should encourage people in the business, both men and women, uh, in order to try and make that change? How do we help them do that particular piece? Well, first of all, I suggest that. We all need to sharpen our radar, if you like, for the way that language is used to talk about um, violence against women. And I've just picked that phrase purposely because um, when we, you'll see it all the time in newspapers or in, in, um, on the television, and they'll say, um, a woman was raped or a young man was stabbed. And it's like, well, who by? Aliens? Who was doing this? Well, it, it was men that did it. So why, why do we listen to things in a passive voice? Why is it not made very clear who the perpetrators of this, these crimes are? Um, and that we have to start to unpick, well, why would society feel really uncomfortable with naming perpetrators or the gender of those perpetrators? We know that 96% of all murders are done by men. Um, why is that? Uh, so the, the whole issue that, uh, that was raised, if you like, by, by Sarah Everard's death um, is this huge outpouring of grief, specifically because, and you know, there's a woman murdered every day in the UK, why Sarah Everard? It's specifically because the alleged murderer is someone who is supposed to protect women. So at this point, where women have always thought it's not all men, it is this unknown bad apple person that I have to try and avoid, it suddenly throws all of that into question. Who can we trust? Um, if a police officer is the person that has, is the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator of this crime. So I think that's really one of the reasons why this has become such an inflammatory touch point. And particularly, I'm picking up so much in schools that girls are now coming out of the, in the open and telling everybody what's happened to them in schools um, because it's kind, of, it's kind of opened this Pandora's box because people in authority didn't protect. Um, so going back to, so what can uh, employers do? The important thing to remember is the power that you have as an employer. Um, we know that people that go on to, to serious crimes in this area start off with microaggressions. We know that this, the, the alleged murderer Sarah Everard was, was a flasher and you know, was a, said misogynist things. Um, so if we can jump, if we can stop it at that, at that beginning point, at least we can stop it happening in, in a part of, of, the, uh, of a person's kind of daily life that is a huge part of their life, which is their working environment. You know, it's actually protected in the law 
uh, to be able to stamp out that behaviour in, in your workplace, it's not against the law for that behaviour to happen in the street. So, for example, just shouting uh, sexist abuse or something at somebody walking down the street is not illegal at the moment. It is illegal in the workplace. So, if we look at it in terms of you know, business leaders have the power, and but with power comes the responsibility to act. We can actually, working as a collective, begin to make huge changes to our society if we make it very clear to men and women what acceptable behaviour is in terms of men and women uh, working and thriving together. I think that's a, that's a really good point and it's quite interesting as well. What, one of the things which I think the coverage has done, um, so my opposite number who works with me on, on East Coast Trains, overheard me talking actually to one of you guys um, in, in this area uh, and when I put the phone down was absolutely horrified because he had no idea that's how people were behaving and was looking for some cues how it might help us prevent it happening again and was also very keen to make it clear um, that he wanted to make sure that we had a no tolerant no toleration of anything of that nature within East Coast trains, which I found very, very supportive. So the other thing is, you know, it, it, let's hope it is a small group of people who are responsible for some of these behaviours, but there are a lot of very good people, both men and women out there. What I would say to the men on the call, we need you to help us change this um, more than you will ever know, um, because actually that one conversation with Phil, my opposite number on this particular subject, really, really underlined for me some of the changes that I wanted to do in terms of the culture of building these coast trains. Um, to make sure that we could actually go try and get some female train drivers, which will be a bit of a miracle in itself, and one or two other things. And knowing I've got him support in that undertaking is a game changer for me. Um, so I, I think my adding, which is less uh, educated than, than Julius to this bit of the conversation, is be brave, um, because we need you and we need your voices and the way that you talk about it to support us in what we're doing. So, so Julia, um, do you want to just sum up where we are and then we'll turn it over to questions. So guys, just while Julia's gathering her thoughts, if you look at your screens, there's a little tiny item called questions. Uh, if you can use that rather than chat, um, anything you want to ask Julia and start firing them in, um, we'll, we'll, we'll finish with a few questions back and forth. Julia, I mean, do you want to just give us a synopsis of where do we start with this subject? What, what's the three things we should be doing whilst, the, whilst gathering their thoughts as well? Is that okay? Well, I'd start with um, actually recognising that this is an issue that needs to be solved. This is a problem that needs to be solved. It's, uh, you know, I'm looking at who's on the call today and there are far women than there are men. And I have to say, we do have to step forward to say that this is this is also an issue that, that faces men. And particularly if they're the leaders of businesses, it's affecting their business profitability. Um, so I'd ask people that are entrepreneurs and engineers to see this for the business opportunity that it is you know to tackle these issues and to create an inclusive culture um, but also you know for those with an engineering mindset to look at it with their usual problem solving tools and skills and identify so what is actually you know in this process where's the where's the blocker where's the issue and, and, and focus in on that um, I'd say look at um, data and disaggregate it by sex so th this is rarely done but when you do that you will start to see there are huge differences between how men perceive um, situations and women so for example employee satisfaction surveys or engagement surveys should be disaggregated by sex so you can see what do women think and what do men think of the organization Customer satisfaction should be disaggregated on that basis where possible. Um, and you should be looking at data with regards to how many people are applying to you, how many recruits, you know, what, who gets promoted and who leaves, again, disaggregated by gender. To spot these different experiences that are happening between men and women. I've, no, I've seen companies that have started on the journey, and for example, their employee engagement survey had um, something like 75% um, satisfaction in men and 30% satisfaction in women. But four years later, when they put in place uh, much more um, actions to create inclusion, it's now the women 
and men are now virtually the same, but at a higher level, 85% employee engagement as a result of the actions. So you see who was benefiting from the previous culture was actually also benefiting now a little bit more from the new culture, whereas and women have hugely benefited from it. Um, I'd say to fight some myths, fight the myths of, of meritocracy. You know, if you're in a, if you have a homogenous employee group, you probably are not a meritocracy. No matter how many times you say, I only hired the best person for the job, you probably aren't because you're probably not even meeting the best person for the job. Um, and the final point is to fight this myth of positive discrimination, that anything that's done to try and remove disadvantages to women is disadvantaging because that isn't the case. We, you know, this is actually a win-win scenario. Um, and, and my final point, because this is actually number four, <laughs> but if you are in the automotive value chain, please do consider joining the Automotive Third of Club um, and collaborate with all of the CEOs and MDs that are in this network that are working together and sharing ideas uh, to find the right fixes for these problems and to build a sector that will attract the best talent um, in, in the sector in its broadest form um, in a skills, um, if you like, race for um, high performing people. Julia, that was great. So we've, we've got questions starting to come through and, and Ros is joining us as well now. So we've just got a couple of minutes for those. Yeah, Helen, I was um, wondering whether um, we should take this, take a question um, yeah. and then we can come back and, and answer some more questions in the summary of the discussion at the end. Is that OK? Super. So, so the one we've got at the moment is from Dean Jones, who's the Partnerships and Outreach Manager at Buckingham Enterprise, an innovation unit. And I think it's a it's a really good question, and it's the one I, I think really matters. It's pertinent, and he, and he says, you know, how do you cut through the noise? There are so many important conversations to be had around inclusion and diversity. Quite challenging to talk about gender balance at the moment without sort of talking about someone saying, well, what about race as well? And actually, you know, that's a really really good point, and inclusion on all all fronts. So how how do you cut through the noise and make sure that when I'm overbalancing a gender against another? Julia, any any thoughts on that at all? Um, it boils down really to understanding the difference between inclusion and diversity. So yes, the priority is to build an inclusive culture, perhaps at the moment is excluding half of the population, women, and also minorities who are a much smaller part of the population, but very important to the success of your business. Diversity is then within those groups, it's the different range. So. You know, if you're going to say um, we need to include men and women, you're then looking at how, how, what level of diversity of men, diversity of women. So there is no kind of subordination of gender issues under uh, a diversity banner. It's actually the other way around. If you think of it in a kind of taxonomy, it is actually gender balance first because it's 51% to 49% of the population. And then within that, how do we get diverse men and women? Uh, in terms of how do you cut through, which is an even bigger issue, is I suggest people go away and read about nudge theory, because this is all about following the crowd, following the herd. So if your herd at the moment is all <laughs> trotting along in the wrong place, it's how do you make the influences in that herd start to trot in the right direction? Um, and therefore, people will see themselves as an anomaly if they don't follow the new norms. Um, so my, my um, suggestion on this is always to understand human behaviour, see who your key influences and leaders are. They're not always the ones with stripes. They're often uh, other people that have just got charisma and get those on board, target those to be on board, and then the rest tend to follow. OK, Julia, thanks for that. And um, perhaps we can touch on intersectionality at some point as well um, later in the conversation or at the end. Um, and I know that um, a lot of the things that we've talked about in this conversation um, are covered in your book. Um, and that's something that people, if they haven't bought it, you know, that is an easy thing to do is to buy the book, change the game and then um, ask for help as to how you then um, take the next step. But 
thank you so much to Helen and Julia for that really helpful conversation to start taking this subject and applying it, um, which we're doing hopefully for the whole of this morning. Something that I think that everyone will really appreciate now um, is the interview, Julia, that you recorded for this event um, between yourself and John Tordoff, the CEO of JCT 600. Um, um, I think um, the, the, the reason he'll be helpful is because he's an inclusive leader and someone that you've been working with. So um, shall we, without further ado, press the play button on that and um, we'll go from there. So let's um, sit back and enjoy this interview, everyone, and then we'll come back in the room for a quick uh, catch up before the breakout sessions. So it's my great pleasure to welcome here John Tordoff. He's the chief executive of a company called JCT 600. Uh, so welcome, John. Would you like to just start by explaining a little bit about your company, uh, the number of sites, etc., and your history, please? Thanks, Julia. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm John Tordoff. I'm chief executive of JCT 600. Um, we're a family-owned business based in York. Sure. Uh, we are 75 years old. I'm the um, third generation of the family that works in the business. Um, and uh, my sons and daughters and my brother's uh, sons and daughters, they all work in the business as well. So we are a, a proper multi-generational business. Um, we, um, the, the size of the business turnover is about £1.3 billion. Pounds. We have about 52 locations stretching from Newcastle up in the northeast down to Boston in Lincolnshire. Um, we represent 23 of the world's best motoring manufacturers from such brands such as Porsche, Ferrari, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Aston Martin, through to Audi, um, Volkswagen um, and volume brands such as Vauxhall, Peugeot, Seat, Mazda, Kia, MG, Mitsubishi, um, we, we've got um, quite a, quite a, a, a range of businesses. Um, we employ about two thousand two hundred people, um, and um, generally speaking, I'd say we're a very very successful business. So the story of a company that started off with one single site and has now grown hugely uh, with the responsibility for the the employment of many many people. Um, yeah. So. The discussion really today is about values and uh, I know you've read my book John, uh, the books about how values create value and the importance of actually, you know, really stepping back and reflecting on, on what your personal values are and how they ref are reflected in your business. So can you tell us what your company values are and, and, and your view about how important it is that the culture embodies your personal values well we um our value journey as it were um i mean we've not as a business we've not always had values that we uh, we, 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 we try and adhere to i mean obviously when the business was much much smaller and you know the guy who owns the business is is in is, you know really at the, at the um on at the leading edge of the business every day he's, he's in the showroom he's in the workshops etc etc at that level you can impart your values on the people and a, and a much easier a much easier but what we experienced certainly in my tenure as chief executive was a rapid expansion of the business where we um more than doubled the size of the business and you introduced different tiers of management etc so the people on the shop floor see less and less of the person who is actually at the uh, you know driving the driving the, the ship as it were um and we were um we were just about to uh, complete an acquisition where we we were going to um, take on an extra 450 colleagues about eight years ago and um and it struck us that it was going to be really difficult to get these these 450 new people to actually get a real grasp of who we were what we were about what we liked what we didn't like what we stood for um, and so we, we decided we needed to create some some company values. Um, 
Now, one thing we definitely didn't do was was just as directors sit in a cold, dark room and, and write them out and say, right, these are our values and you will all obey them. Um, we engaged with uh, quite a lot of colleagues from all all over the business, from all different like, management, non-management, et cetera, et cetera. And we asked them what their what their thoughts were with regards to the values of the company. Um, and we got all sorts of feedback, some amazing feedback about it. And then the seven values that we eventually came up with were pretty much an amalgamation of their ideas, which we all thought they, uh, they had a lot of credibility across the business. I'll read you them out. They're, they're on my mouse mat here. Um, so that first value is team, valuing teamwork. Respect, more important than ever. Um, communication, we think you can never communicate enough. Passion, you've got to be passionate about what you do. Integrity, that's my favourite one. Um, excellence, you're striving to the best you, you possibly can be every day. Dynamic, and um, and yeah, certainly within the last 12 months in our industry, we've had to be dynamic. Um, and I say since since we uh, since we um, created our value values and we announced them to the works and everything, we did what we did what every business does you know we, we printed it on mouse mats we printed a bit on mugs and on pens and on notebooks and we put it on murals on the wall and you, you name it we did it all um but that's that's only the, like the tip of the, the iceberg the real foundation comes with when the when people expect to see certainly myself and my directors living the values of the business day in day out because only when they see that happening does, does do the words come alive and and it cascades down the business and and people start to realise actually they're serious about this and and the, you know the bosses live the values and so you know I have to live the values too. And I'm going to focus in on two of those values now. So respect and yeah. integrity. Now. Yeah. My, as, I, as I outlined in my book, in order for women to thrive, in order for us to actually get the business success that we, that we do get from a gender balanced business, we have to ensure that there isn't a culture that undermines women or damages them, such as microaggressions or harassment or even as serious as, as assaulting women. Um, so what's your views with regards to you know, the importance of creating a culture in which women can feel safe and 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 you know, not subject to that kind of behaviour. Well, it, it's I think it's a fundamental um, part of the success of any business is to have a balanced um, workforce in terms of gender, ethnicity, um, you name it. You, you have to strike the right balance, and certainly in my industry, the motor the motor retail industry. Typically, it has been the domain of white, middle-aged um, men for a good number of years. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and, yeah, I look, I look in at the, the past history of, 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 of my own business. Uh, and, you know, the, the only females you saw in the business were uh, perhaps working in the accounts department as clerks. Um, the only people of any different different ethnicity or they might have been working in the workshop or such like, such like and I have to say it was a pretty horrible environment for those those people to work in um, you know sexism and racism were rife as, as it was generally in society I have to you know so I'm not I'm not particularly singling out my own industry um, but the world's moved on and and you have to you know as I say one of our, our our um, values is uh, being dynamic, and then you have to you have to embrace the change that's going on in society. If you want to stay, if you want to remain a successful business, um, and and we've done that. Uh, I think we've done that very very well over the last few years um, by li living and breathing the values, but also by implementing an absolutely zero tolerance approach to any. Any misdemeanors or uh, anybody who, who falls short of the of the values and, and doesn't display the respect that that people deserve when they come to work every day. I think it's a really important point to make that you know that it's reflecting wider society. And as we've heard, you know, in the last few days, 
um, society and justice isn't always on the side of, of women. And there's, um, for example, the, the statistic read out in Parliament yesterday is that 98.5% of rapes reported go unprosecuted. So pretty much if you're going to rape somebody in Britain, you'll get away with it. Um, and that you harass somebody in the streets, there isn't actually, that's not a criminal offence. But the, thanks to the Equality Act of 2010, it is a criminal offence in work. And so leaders do have the power to do something about it that maybe other aspects of society don't. So, you know, in terms of the employment of, of perpetrators, um, there is the power to try and stop this behaviour, nip it in the bud and make sure that people that are that maybe not realising that this isn't appropriate or thinking that, not knowing it's inappropriate, but thinking they can get away with it, need to be nudged into a different set of behaviours, don't they? So I was very shook to hear about how you handled this in JCT 600 by actually showing staff in the form of a film what inappropriate behaviour looks like um, and then showing implementing the zero tolerance so that it was you know there's no question about somebody saying they didn't understand what it meant so can you share us a little bit more yeah. well that? i mean you ask you ask uh, people you know, to share an example of something that they're seen that might be sexist or racist or whatever and they immediately sort of refer to something that you know, you know, an incident that might be as you said bordering on assault um, and they think, and people think, oh yeah, that's totally unacceptable, and you know, absolutely, you know, that has to, you know, would never tolerate anything like that around here. But it, it, there's so much more to it than just that, and and you know, the good old word banter in the office and in the workshop and in the workplace and everything, which is is borderline um, assault in so many ways. Um, and yeah, you, you hear the conversations that um, that go on in, and certainly. Um, We've we've experienced it in our environment where you've got some you know, plenty of male testosterone going on in the sales department from a group of young sales execs, and there might be um, a young female sales exec sat in the corner there who's just mortified by what she's listening to. But when you know the guys are talking about what they got up to at the weekend and where they went and what they did and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and you you've got some, you can see you've got some poor young girl sitting there thinking. My God, it's you know what am I listening to here? I, I really don't want to listen to this kind of banter. Um, and so we um, we we created a, a series of short videos um, which highlighted some of the examples that we that we um, that we'd come across. Um, and uh, because we 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 had a program we called it JCT Six Hundred and Me, and we we actually encouraged people to call out about. Uh, behaviour that they'd either loved or they'd heard about, etc., that they thought showed a complete lack of respect. Um, and these are just some of the examples of things that that people to our attention. And and it, it, it is it is the still meeting in the morning about what I got. You know, what did you get up to last night? Then and oh, and the girls, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And. And you just say, my God, <laughs> it's just dreadful. And so we created a series of videos based on these events. Um, we actually got uh, colleagues to play the chat, uh, et cetera. So the people that were watching the videos actually recognised a lot of the faces. And it had a massive impact because I think it made people realise that, you know, in order to, to show respect, you know, I just need to be careful about the things that I say, the things that I do on an ongoing basis. It's not about getting into fisticuffs with someone. It's about just subtle little things that you say and that you do on an ongoing basis. However well mannered, they can be kept taken completely out of context by somebody who thinks it's absolutely disgraceful what you just said. And and you know, people you know, say to me, uh, they, have, they have done in the past, you know, well, it was only such and such and everything. And I just say to them, yeah, but if someone said that to your, to your wife, your mum, your daughter, your sister, how would you feel? And they go, mm, yeah, true, yeah, 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 good point. Um, and it, and eventually the, the penny drops. Um, and um, I'm pleased to say, since I mean, it's, it's two years ago now since we created these videos. Um, and, and the HR 
team that, that you know they periodically um release them again and, and just uh, ask people to refer themselves on it and everything since then we, you know, it, it's few and far between the number of, of examples of, of people that have sort of felt the need to call out for really really poor behavior and um, so it certainly seems to have done the trick mm. and i think it's what's so powerful about it is that you've used the respect part of your of your values so everyone understands the values and that that's what it's the code the code of conduct within jct 600 and in fact the sexual harassment laws are based around the words you know if this affects somebody's dignity or res or respect uh, and so in essence that's what we're talking about you know it's at the very heart of of the issue is respect for women respect for colleagues respect for treating women as professionals and equals um, and by talking about it in that way it's not as inflammatory if you know what i mean as, as maybe saying you know got to be careful what we say in front of women it's about saying we should all respect each other and this is the standard that's required to work in this company so i think that's why it's, it's been very successful mm. um, so i'd like to ask you about how important it is for you as the leader or or what you would say to other owners and leaders of businesses about you personally calling out inappropriate behavior if you hear it from management team or see it in colleagues or even peers that aren't in the same company it is i mean at the end of the day you know if, if there's if there's 100 people working in an organization it, re it, it the success failure of it ultimately rests on the shoulders of the person at the at the head of that organization and if they don't live and breathe the values and demonstrate um demonstrate to their colleagues on a daily basis then they can't reasonably expect any of the any of the colleagues and associates to do the same because they all look at it and say, well, you don't, <laughs> there's nobody worse than you for saying things like mm -hmm. that. There's nobody worse than you for not following the rules. So why do you expect expect us to? So uh, ultimately, you know, the, the, the responsibility does fall on the shoulders of the, uh, the, the head of the organization. Um, and, you know, a, a few uh, a couple of years ago one of our leadership groups um that we that we we, we send on a, a, a coaching uh, course um they uh, they came back and they did the, they, they all do a myers briggs and everything and they get they get to understand their own personality time and one of i've never seen this happen before and the uh, the coach who was who was he said he said what 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 um personality type is jct 600 as a business and they all got their heads together and they all were, they all did it and, and it came out it, um the personality type was an istj and um interestingly steve the coach who took the boy said that that is really interesting because uh your boss is an istj <laughs> <laughs> so i guess that i guess that's the ultimate sort of uh, accolade that um the guy who's who's uh, yeah got his head on above the parapet is um you know, his values and his personality reflected in the rest of the business and a, a business of this scale like 2200 people so um yeah i think that's a tick in the box is that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah very good uh, so finally um the audience that are watching this today are mainly owners uh, founders startup companies with big you know ambitions for growth etc what advice would you give them in terms of starting now as they're fairly small um, to building inclusive values and thinking about gender balance and the right culture from the very beginning? Well, a small startup business, you, know, you, you, you probably don't need to uh, have you know, clear values and have them plastered across the walls and, and on mouse mats and mugs and pens and paper and everything um, like, like we've had to do because the people who you've been working with and who you're interacting with presumably you're going to be seeing them pretty much every day on a day by day basis and you very you'll very quickly get to get to see whether they share the same values as yourself or not as the, as the case may be um, people who don't share the same values people who are 
um, sort of standing in the way of, of, of taking the business in the direction that you want to take it down, particularly that it would be a gender balanced, successful business. Um, you, 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 you do need to have a, a zero tolerance and, and, and kind of um, deal with these people. Um, there's this, this, this one of the things that we that we as a business have certainly learned over the last 12 months through the, the COVID pandemic um, is the transformation in this business has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you know, I, I think we were we were braced for it because we, we've done a lot around change management. And one of one you know, people just hate change. People just, I just don't change anything. I just like it the way it is. But the world is changing. If you don't change, and you, you're not going to keep up. Um, and you know, we've 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 embraced so much change over the last two months. You know, I'm you know I'm talking talking to you from home here. You know, I go into the office uh, for an hour a week at the moment. <laughs> you know, I have an exchange of documents. I take one pile of documents back, pick another pile of documents up, I go home. You know, if someone had told me a year ago that's how my life routine would be, I'd have said, it. But it's the same for all our directors. We're all working from home. But the business is very, very successful, you know, and uh, there's, there's so many ways uh, to change a business for the better. Um, that, but, you, you, but you have to take that step. You have to take the plunge and you have to be, you have to be true to your convictions and you have to be you know, true, to, you know, true to yourself. And if that's where you, you want to take the business, then that's what you know, you've got to, um, you know, one step at a time. Um, but, you know, I, I would, em I, personally, I would embrace... Um, the changes in society that are going on in terms of you know, allowing people the balance to work from home if it helps them, allowing people to work working hours that helps that helps them. Um, because not only will you create a, a more positive and engaged workforce, you'll also um, it also help you find better people who, who who just don't want to be a slave to the system. And you know, I know, you know, you know I have to be at eight o'clock in the morning, and I'm not allowed to leave until five thirty. And it doesn't really matter what I do between those times, as long as I clock in and I clock out on time. Nothing else really seems to matter. You know, like people work from home a day a week. Um, if it helps, you know, if it helps that one person got childcare issues to, to to be really really good at their job, because they'll pay you about tenfold. Um, there's so many little examples of that that, that we that we've um, come across over the last, I said, more so the last year. Uh, it, it's been incredible. Um, I mean, things like you know, for years and years and years, um, you know, we all you know, we all go to work wearing you know, stuffy suits and shirts and ties. You know, this is I think this is about the third day this year that I've actually put a shirt with a collar on. That's <laughs> <laughs> just that for us. <laughs> And, and yeah, when we when we reopen for business, you know, we're we're changing our dress code. We're going to make it a lot more relaxed. We're introducing smart working, so people uh, can work the how the hours that that suits them, uh, providing it, it suits the business as well. But if someone wants to work at, from, you know, finish at three o'clock in the afternoon because they need to pick kids up from school, or, or they want to start at ten because they've got to drop the kids off at school, we're gonna we're gonna do our utmost to accommodate that. Um, and, and you know we are working in a new retail environment as well. So we you know, we've got customers coming through through the doors from 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. Um, seven days a week. And we only shut four days a year on the four bank holidays. Um, but you know we're we're quite confident that that we can uh, embrace all these changes and retain some really really good people, but also attract some even better people who are going to want to work for us because. Yeah, they say that we're a, you know, we're a modern thinking business that's um, yeah, trying to with the people that it employs uh, and, and get them engaged and get them on board rather than just seeing them as a, an employee number. And, you know, as long as you're here at eight and you're still here at half five, don't, nothing else matters. Well, and that's a really good point to end on, John, because, of course, all of these companies watching that are planning on growth will want to attract the best talent, the mm. best people. And so any of these um, you know, tips and advice about how to how to attract those people is is going to be really useful. And I think the, the point that you've made about making the work working practices fit for the 21st century and for the mm. lifestyles that we all lead will attract talent of both sexes. And that's something that they that they need to understand. And the the other big take-home message is of course um, 
you know, build the business with the value of respect and integrity built in from the beginning. And, yeah. and then hopefully you won't, won't come across these issues of microaggressions and harassment taking place in the workplace. And that will be a huge benefit to society if, if that yeah. can happen. So thank you very much, John Tordoff, Chief Executive of JCT 600. It's really great to talk to you. And, uh, you know, I hope you've uh, enjoyed speaking to us today. No, I have. It's been a pleasure. Always uh, happy to help Julia. And if, uh, if, if I've said anything that makes one person just move the needle on 1%, then job done. Great. Thank you very much, John. So hopefully uh, everyone found that really um, encouraging. Um, we know that John has been working on this with Julia over the years and already had a, um, you know, his own uh, way of thinking that he wanted to, to be inclusive and, and had the, that set of um, aspirations for his business to reflect him and, and, and how he carries himself in the world and that you know, his name's above the door. So how does that organisation um, represent him? And how can he maximise business opportunity by leading uh, that team? And, and uh, you know, one of the things I should say is that, as Julia said earlier, anyone that wants to join the Automotive 30% Club and benefit from all those insights, you should really consider doing that as one of the steps you can take after today. Um, so with the interview between Helen and Julia, the this conversation, um, the piece that you've just listened to there, the interview um, with Wim Tordoff, we're now going to go into uh, these breakout sessions, which Pim has set up for us. Um, you should know what table number you're on. Pim might want to come on in a minute and guide us into those rooms. And we've got 20 minutes to consider, you know, what as a, in, individually we can do. And the sort of things to think about are the day-to-day -day small changes that could have a massive effect. So, you know, how do you start changing the culture in your organisation? And what will you pledge to do this afternoon even as a result of this discussion? Is it something in your policies? Is it to do with the recruitment? Is it the general chit-chat between colleagues? Will it be something to do with thinking about staff and career progression? Um, the disaggregation of, of data by gender, the code of conduct, including respect, the flexible working, the things that John's just been talking about. Really like you to think now in these sessions about how this relates to you. And if you could so appoint someone in the group that's going to then report back when we come back in 20 minutes time, we'll then um, hear a little bit about um, what you're starting to think about doing, the game changers um, in your organisation. So, Pim, can I ask you to help us to move into our breakout sessions now, please? Yes, not a problem. Just to You're on mute, I think. I shouldn't be. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, there's just a slight delay, I think. That's okay, no worries. Um, just to help everybody, so um, we're going to put you back into the social lounge. We've got tables set up with all the table numbers. Uh, just very quickly, um, I'll call out um, who should go onto onto which table very quickly. So, if Shirley, Chris, and Melissa could go to table one, please. If Dean, Fiona, and Ruth can go to table two, please. And if uh, Nikki, Jeremy, Caroline, and David can go to table three. And then, if Andrea, Carl, and Marcus can join table four, please. That would be ideal. And then um, we'll start now. Give it twenty minutes, and then we'll bring you back in here. Thank you very much. Um, talk about the breakout session, the discussion that was had. So if we start with, I think, table one, um, which was my table, and Shirley, do you want to report back on a bit about our discussion? Um, we've got a total of 15 minutes here, so just two or three summary, because we can also, because we've, we've, we've allocated you a um, speaker status, we can also always bring you back in again. And if anyone has any questions as we go along, please feel free to put questions in to the question section as, as people are feeding back. So, hello then, Shirley. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shirley Harrison. I work at the University of Sheffield Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield. 
Um, my main job is working with businesses, which is how come I met Pim a little while ago. I spoke at one of the general events about how to access our translational research. Uh, but in October, I took on a part-time role of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Director. So uh, I've been furiously finding out lots of things about that and how to approach it. Uh, we decided, I decided, that we would focus on gender pay gap. Uh, we're a research and engineering and manufacturing organisation. Uh, there are lots of men and many of the, all the senior people mostly are men. So uh, I chose gender pay gap because it is the only externally measured uh, area. You know, so there is a public, a public number that has to be published. That's why we decided to focus on it. And I took a data approach. So if you've got to set a target, you better understand how you're going to get there and how you can affect it. So I took a data approach, started looking at uh, men and women, uh, grades, type of role, who'd been promoted, who hadn't, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And what I found extremely powerful about that was that when I then presented that to the very senior people in the organisation who could say yeah or nay to my proposals in terms of actions, even though the data was kind of stuff they already knew, you know, you know there aren't a lot of women, that's why you've appointed me. Um, it made it, it was extremely powerful to present charts and data, partly because I guess I'm presenting to engineers and I'm an engineer, but, but, but there was more to it than that. It just makes it, you know, you, can, you sort of can't argue with it. It's there, right in front of you, it's easy to understand. And from that, then, we're, we're leading into actions. One of the things we discovered, which was a little bit surprising, was certain types of roles have almost no women and almost no women apply to them. And so the actions that we're taking there are around looking at who's applying and looking at the way that we write job descriptions. So we're moving from a very kind of you must have two years experience doing this and understand this software package to an outcome basis. What is it that this job had to, has to achieve? Oh, this job is about researching and analysing data and presenting it to a variety of audiences. OK, that's what we're going to write in the job description then. And that's what we're going to test when we do the selection. Um, and then thinking about where we advertise, and, uh, those kind of things, and just really thinking about the processes that we're using. And we and Chris and Melissa were also on the call. And we were talking about their very different um, setups that starting a business and um, thinking about um, the getting a book, Julia. And, um, you know, I suppose the people in our group are really keen to do their bit. Um, and what we were talking about was the fact that you probably don't know what you don't know. Um, and so if you read the book, then there might be good ideas in there that might open up some thoughts about you know, the very best way to approach this um, as a person who's willing and keen, um, what, what technically can you do to make sure that you widen the talent pool fully? So thank you for Shirley. I'm conscious that we're going to try and finish on time. So I'm going to move along now, if that's OK, Pim, um, to the next room. I think we've got four rooms in total. So room two is Dean, is it? Hello, Dean. Hi, can you I oh. ask you to be um, yeah, fairly brief? That's OK. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So uh, my name's Dean. I'm from the Buckingham Enterprise and Innovation Unit at the University of Buckingham. Um, I was in a group with Fiona and Helen uh, and we started the conversation off with who's going to be the spokesperson for this group. And I, for the first time in a long time, didn't tell forward because I didn't think it was my place to do that in this particular conversation. But uh, it was argued by Fiona in particular that, that I should be the voice of the group because I am a, because I am a man, and that and that led us on to the conversation about more men needing to lead the conversation with other men about achieving gender balance in work environments or any environments. Um, my own personal situation is that I've been asked to um, to lead on the diversity and inclusivity um, group within the university, and the same I had the same reaction. I didn't feel one sort of qualified or in the right place to do that and which is why i've come to, to meetings like this to just try and get a grasp of whether or not whether or not i have got enough of a grasp of it and whether i am qualified enough to to lead on that uh, and we talked about all sorts of things we talked about um the perceptions and attitudes um sometimes being uh, coming from a sort of generational um, perspective how people who are perhaps in an of an older generation are more inclined to particular views and values and attitudes people of a younger generation uh, have a completely different grasp of this whole topic and 
that some of us are of an age where we sit right between the two yeah, different age people. groups and how you can sometimes feel a bit isolated there. You kind of want <laughs> to champion those people that are younger than you and then kind of rein in those that are slightly older. I mean, it was a really interesting conversation in a very short space of time. Um, there, were, there were lots of other things that were, were mentioned, but, you know, it was really, it did sort of focus on that, how a lot on how men talk about women with other men and how we should be talking about women with other men and what things we should be championing so yeah. really relevant to me actually Re really uh, really interesting brilliant thank you dean for your feedback that's fantastic so go to room or table three now please Kim. hi david welcome oh hi yeah can you can you see me? Am I? I can't see you, but oh, I can okay. Hear you. Sorry. Yeah, my video is on. There you go. Yeah, cool. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah, How did it go see in your it? discussion? What what was said? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I had um, a good little team there with uh, with Caroline, Nikki, and Jack. Um, so we're all coming. I guess we're all coming from different perspectives here, and it was good discussion. We probably didn't have enough time actually. Uh, we started really by. Um, really trying to absorb a little bit from the discussions from um, from John and also from Julia. I think there was some f f there was some real um, things that resonated with us in there. I, I, I think we, we started a little bit by we had some alignment in terms of things like core values. We, we've ultimately there, there needs to be it's yeah. the, um, have to set some strategic commitment in this space. So, so we all have to be responsible for that. And you know, I'm I'm particularly sensitive myself because there I am. I'm, I'm in that class that classical area of being a, a white male in a highly dominated engineering manufacturing environment. So sure. I my, my the way I describe it is my tentacles are fully open and have to sense what's what's going on around. I think also there was a there was a good discussion about you know where John John was really looking at the fundamentals of core values. Again, that really has to come down from you know personal as a leader your personal core values, and that has to really uh, be lived. And and the all of your staff as you develop from from a small startup to a bigger company that it, it's a fundamental building book for for the. For, for this big agenda that, that we're moving into you know you've got to get that right you can't just have it on the wall yeah. you really need to live it uh, and you you and it shouldn't be just something that's imposed and this is it it's on a nice glossy brochure i think you have to spend some time really probably in the uh, continually really evolving those core values with and involve all all of the staff and all of that uh, that diversity that's in there Fantastic. and then it, you know I, I think um nikki made a good point you know she's she's on startup so i think she's learned a lot here in that as she now grow business she's had all of this good feedback understanding and probably some direction so that was quite cool and then you know that the last comment i think julia really stimulated right at the end and then we got cut off but was about really um you know leaders we need to accept that stop being in denial because we're all saying well it doesn't have my business and i can be guilty of that so i need to get beyond that <laughs> get beyond that and go behind it and go yeah no maybe i am i just go and ask questions so it's openness i suppose yeah really. that's fantastic david thank you so much for that feedback and okay. um Will we, I think that the main thing is that this is just the start and we're in it together and you know yeah. Silverstone Technology Cluster Committee can help and people that are members of that committee can all individually help as well yeah. and um, it would be just fantastic to look back on you know the first two sessions that we've done here I know you're on the board of Silverstone Technology Cluster so you're watching it closely and I think you were um, you know uh, surprised by what you heard in the October session and then you know you're now starting yeah. to embrace it and so I think it would be really fantastic to yeah. to sort of look at look back on you know in a year's time on this journey that we've just started together and mm. the changes we can make. So thank you for your input. Yeah. yeah. Hi Marcus, yeah. welcome. You must be the representative for the final 
room four. Hi, Roz. How are Hello. you? Um, so yeah, we had a really good interesting chat with Hannah and Andrea in the in our little talk. Um, just a bit on us. I'm a Marcus Freeman, uh, Managing Director of Silton Composite. It's a small, medium-sized business. Um, we're five years old. And I think what we touched on really was, it was more probably aimed at myself and our company and our culture and how I want to change that moving forwards. When I started the company up, I'd learned from many other businesses that they were copy and paste of one another and had certain cultures. And I wanted to eliminate that. Um, but I probably hadn't ticked them all off. And one of the biggest ones was, uh, from the first um, of these events was learning the sort of the horror stories as such, which I don't like to dwell on, but that had gone on in the sector that I'm heavily involved in. But all, equally, I want to change the culture of an art company moving forward and understand how about we go, how about we do that. And for me personally, I know that's led from the top. But as my business grows, the culture has to change within my supervisors, uh, charge hands, managers moving forwards yeah. and to make sure we have the processes, the policies, documentation in place to keep that same culture. So from the meeting from uh, Julia and John earlier, it was lovely to hear how that they implemented that into their business, especially John, uh, the videos that were showed reflection of what had gone on. And I think that would change the individuals that are in my company, not necessarily from what they do from a day-to-day -day basis, because those guys are the reason why my business is successful, is because they're a really close network team and we work together. But equally, as we employ new people from different genders, etc., that we need to make sure that that same passion and focus is, is passed down from throughout the cultures. Yeah. Um, and also for me, I'm not especially how I need to understand how I'm going to implement this into my company. So to have these talks with yourselves and get help, Hannah's already offered her support moving forwards and how we implement that into our business. Yeah. Because it's all good and well me leading it from the top, but times I need the advice and support and how we Absolutely. structure that and change that culture within the company that is the fairest and most sensible way of doing it. So that's what, what I learned really Fantastic. from and that's for us as a company that's what we want to do moving forward so brilliant brilliant change. marcus thank you for that and and i think just to respond to what you were saying there about needing help i think that's got to be the first step that you know as a result of, of of listening and getting the insights and thinking yes okay this is a this issue maybe in my business maybe not maybe for one individual maybe all of them you know whoever it is or whether it's the whole company um I, I need to look at this seriously because if I can get this right, I'll improve my chances as a business and performance as a business, and hopefully, yeah, know you know, em employ lots of, of good people and um, and and have a and have a sort of fantastic working environment that's very productive. That, and that's the thing: as we grow, I don't want it to be too late that we haven't addressed like the times now. The sooner we do it, the better, in my eyes, because yes, the, that culture and structure in place, we can make the difference moving forwards. It only makes, like I say, it only makes our work environment a more positive reflection and people want to come to work and enjoy working for us. So the more we do about it, it's, it's better. So Yeah. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate that. So we're just um, out of time. Um, I just wanted to make a few final points. I just firstly want to thank um, Julia, Helen, Hannah. Um, who worked with Pim and myself to put today together, especially Julia for, you know, getting John to, to do that um, interview as well, because I think that's so powerful to hear from a like-minded business leader, um, you know, not a million miles from us in terms of the sector that he works in and the issues that he's got to share like that, especially for us. So, um, yeah, thank you to the STC committee for, for helping to put this on. And then to all of you, um, I think it would just be so good if you could think, what is that one step even that you're going to take today to start to make those changes? Um, and if you can't think of anything at this stage or it's it's a bit sort of going to go slightly onto the pile on the to do list, then at least go onto Amazon and buy Change the Game by Julia Muir and start reading it. You do have to read it for it to take effect. And of course, ask for help because 
that's why the STC diversity committee has been put together to help the businesses in Silverstone Technology Cluster. So an email, a phone call to say, OK, what do I do next? Um, we are here to help and we want to do that because we think it will make your business environments better, more prosperous. So uh, don't forget as well to look at the automotive 30% club and think, think about joining that, especially if you work in the automotive in industry, because then you'll get the chance to hear more from people like John who have been they're ahead of us in the process. So um, without further ado, I'll hand back to Pim. Thank you all for taking part today. And let's keep talking about this and acting positively to change the game. Excellent. Thank you, Ros. Um, I hope everybody sort of enjoyed that, uh, found it uh, an interesting event. Um, I certainly did. Ros, thank you very much for um, guiding us through it all. Um, excellent stuff. And I'll, I'll echo all your views in, in um, thanking the, the, the committee um, for them to join. Um, now, as per, per usual, we'll do a follow up email. So you get a recording of this event um, and obviously we'll share some details as well uh, with you to, to follow up. Um, but if this is something that uh, you want help with or, or there's anything we can do, please do reach out to us as well. And we're, we're very happy to put you in touch with the, with the relevant people and, and try to guide you as, uh, as much as possible. Because obviously, ultimately, we want to make sure that the in the SDC are sort of all lined up to make themselves as good as they can possibly be, like Mark was saying. You know, make yourself attractive, make yourself um, sort of a modern, inclusive and supportive company to make sure that you attract the best people. Um, and ultimately, that's that's what it's all about. So um, so thank you very much for joining. Um, really appreciate that. What we'll do is um, we'll we'll finish the session here, but we'll keep the social hours open. Um, so if you wanted to take a, a seat on any table and, and you're released off your table number, so you can you can go with any table that you like. Uh, but if you want to carry on the conversation or do a little bit of networking, we'll leave the room open until about 12.30. Uh, so please feel free to do that um, and then obviously um, just sort of depart as you're ready and, and enjoy the rest of your day. But um, thank you very much for joining and obviously keep on the lookout for future events. And uh, if there's anything that we can do to always get in touch. So um, thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye bye.